Welcome everyone to today's event, the, human the Ukraine Humanitarian Crisis, Responses to Refugees and Internally Displaced Civilians. Our event today will focus on the war in Ukraine and the unfolding humanitarian crisis. My name is Molly Brunson, and I welcome you today as faculty director of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program at the, at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. This event is co-sponsored by Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program, along with the European Studies Council and the Program on Refugees, Forced Displacement, and Humanitarian Responses. At this terrible moment, we're honored to host three panelists currently on the ground in Eastern Europe. And we're especially grateful that they're taking the time in the midst of their absolutely critical work, and in some cases at the tail end of very long and difficult journeys to talk to us about their experiences and the growing humanitarian crisis related to Ukrainian refugees and internally displaced civilians. According to the United Nations, as of yesterday, that is March 9th, more than 2 million people have now fled Ukraine and more than 1 million people could be displaced within their own country as a result of the war. This is what we'll be talking about today. I'll introduce each of the three panelists today um, who will, will each speak for about 10 minutes before we open up for questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A panel. We will get to as many of them as we possibly can in the hour we have today. Our first speaker will be Mauro Mondello. Mauro is a freelance reporter, war correspondent, documentary filmmaker, and 2020 Yale World Fellow. After that, we will hear from Alena Sotnik. Alena is currently an advisor to the deputy prime minister responsible on humanitarian aid for Ukraine. She is a 2019 Yale World Fellow. Lastly, we'll hear from Olga Ivanova. Olga is the program director of the Charitable Fund Stabilization Support Services in Ukraine. The organization's primary goal is to support vulnerable populations, including internally displaced persons, women, pensioners, ethnic minorities, the LGBT plus community, and more. Olga just recently traveled from Kiev and is now in Krakow. Thank you to all of our three speakers and all of you for being here today. Uh, welcome again. So with that, I'll turn to Mauro, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Molly. And uh, as I was saying a few minutes ago to, to you, I, I wouldn't like to, to, um, to be a bit more prepared uh, for, the, for the invitation, but I literally just arrived. Uh, and uh, so I, I think probably the, 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 the best thing to do right now is to, to explain you a bit uh, how I did arrive here, which tell a lot also about uh, the humanitarian situation, the humanitarian crisis that uh, the Ukrainian people is, is, uh, is living right now. So I, I just arrived in, in, in Romania in, uh, in, a, in a city called Siret, which is just a few kilometers from the border with, with Ukraine. And uh, the situation is is quite uh, tough. Uh, it's uh, minus uh, six degrees here. It's it's snowing uh, very much. And I will show you some picture uh, later that literally I, I just uh, took. And uh, this is a border that uh, actually is possible to uh, to cross uh, by car or also by walk. Uh, but uh, the line in order to cross the border it takes. Uh, six to 10 hours. And uh, this is a border that is open 24 hours per day. And uh, there is a lot of people that actually is, is waiting uh, seven, eight hours uh, with uh, this uh, terrible weather uh, condition just to cross the border. This is a situation that I, that I just experienced uh, to come to Romania, but that I've been already in contact uh, through all the borders where I've been. Uh, it's the same and probably it's also a bit more complicated when you want to cross from uh, Ukraine to Poland, the, the, the most used border between Ukraine and, and Poland, which is the in, in Medica actually, uh, when I was there uh, more than one week ago, it took more than 35 hours actually to, to, to cross it. And, uh, and the one between Hungary and Slovakia also takes 15 to 20 to 20 hours. Uh, 
something that I think it's uh, it's important. You, you already mentioned it a bit, uh, the figures. I think a very important number that we should highlight, and I'm sure that this is a number that will will go on uh, coming. It's uh, the children that are actually we have 2.5 million uh, uh, people that is fleeing Ukraine, and of these ones we have more than 1 million uh, children. And uh, if right now you are you are uh, traveling uh, through the borders of Ukraine and the other countries, and also if you're traveling in Eastern Europe, if you are going in, in Czech Republic, Poland, Budapest, Prague, uh, the scene that you see is always the same. It's, uh, it's uh, everywhere, Ukrainian women with very small children. It's, uh, it's really, uh, it's something that is, uh, incredibly heartbreaking because you 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 see all it's 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 everywhere and uh, a phenomenon that is also that, that we should i think we should understand a bit better is that uh, uh, of course it's written everywhere but we need to remember that men between uh, 18 and 60 years old are not allowed to leave the country so when you are at the border, a scene that you actually are seeing all the time is these uh, uh, fathers, brothers, uh, uh, boyfriend, grandfather that are actually accompanying the family at the border and then they are saying goodbye and they are separating. And this is something that uh, uh, I, I can try to describe uh, more, but uh, it really is... Uh, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to, to explain how strong this is. The sensation that you are actually uh, separating from the most important people that you have uh, and for, for, for better. And, and this is a, a scene that you continuously see. Mm. But there is also another, another phenomenon that, uh, that I believe it's important to underline, which is uh, the, people, the people that is actually coming back. Uh, I've been I've been met, for example, a, a woman that uh, work as a nurse in Italy, and uh, she has. There is a lot a lot of uh, or Ukrainian of course living in Europe and working, and uh, many times it's people that is living in in, uh, in in countries in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, and that is sending money at home. And these women decided to come back. Why? Because she has a 16 years old son. He could live. But he has also a 21 years old son. He could not live, and they live together with their mother. Uh, and the decision was: Do we leave uh, the older son alone in, in Ukraine, or I come back? And she decided to come back. And uh, this is also part of the humanitarian crisis, of course. So we have actually the people that is fleeing the country. We have actually then the people that is coming back to the country because they have not a real choice, and then. Last last part, and I will probably uh, now shave, let you see a bit uh, map because I think it's 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 important to let you understand a bit better uh, what we are talking about. And then we have uh, uh, all an area. I don't know if you can see if you can see also uh, where I where I'm pointing. Uh, all this area where you see Ivano Ivano Frankis, Ksenorvitz, uh, Ushgorod. I'm sorry for my for the way I pronounce this the names of the cities. And all this area is actually an area where a lot of Ukrainian people that can't or don't want to leave the country moved. So up to now, uh, the media's talked correctly about all the people that is fleeing. We cannot, we, we should not remember also the people that is coming back and the people that actually left the city where they usually stay, Kiev, Kharkiv, Dnipro. And they came in this area, why? Because this is an area that is considered somehow safe right now. So cities like Ushkorod and Chernovitz and uh, Mukacheve, which is here. These are all cities of around 80,000 to 100,000 people. Uh, and right now it is impossible in this city to find an accommodation because a lot of families that don't want to, 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 to break the, the, the familiar uh, environment decided to move here so that uh, they can try to keep some kind of normality and because otherwise they would mean like for every family did that the father stay and the mother with the kids live which is what's happening the ones that had the opportunity to do this moved here but 
So if right now you come in the city, for example, Rushkorod, it's a city of uh, 100,000 people. Right now, Ost, 145,000. Uh, Mukasheve, it's a city of 80,000 people. Right now, we have 110. Uh, Chernovitz, it's a city of, if I remember right, 110 or something like that. It's now 145. So it, it, it's incredible in, in this sense, what's happening in this in these cities too. And it's something that, uh, of course, we should also remember and, and, and highlight. And I would like also to, to, to show some picture that I just took, if I, if I am able to, yes. So these are picture that I, that I took just uh, literally a few hours ago from uh, from uh, actually one hour ago from the border uh, are not beautiful picture and I didn't uh, absolutely work uh, on them uh, I just think it's important to show to let you understand also a bit the, the the weather condition that I was talking about before this is the situation right now at the border between uh, Romania and and Ukraine it's uh, it's uh, it's all the time like this. And the last thing I, I would like to, to, to say that I think it's important to, to, to understand is that uh, the situation is going, uh, is not necessarily going uh, to uh, become much better on the humanitarian side because the people that left up to now mostly is people that had the resources and the contacts to do that. Most of the Ukrainian people that left arrive in Poland, in Romania, in Hungary, and then they already know where to go. They have a contact in Germany, a contact in the Netherlands, a contact in Italy, they already know. But there is still an enormous amount of people that had not the resources, uh, not the contacts, and this is where we will need to be um, seriously uh, there. We will really need to help. We will need to be constant in keeping the enormous effort that we are doing in terms of solidarity. We will need to keep this going in the next weeks because this is just the beginning. And this is the a wave of, of Ukrainians that is living, but is living with resources and with contacts. The one that they not will come. And let's see if I have other pictures, but yeah, I think this is, this was, more or less, see, enough interrupting the division. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, I think as, as an introduction to, to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the subject, this is probably enough. So I will give you again the, the, the word, Molly. Thank you, Moro, so much um, for sharing uh, those, those comments, uh, which bring up a number of pressing pressing questions we can discuss further uh, in today's session, but also for showing those photographs, which themselves are, are so powerful. So our next speaker, Elena Sotnik, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to say that, of course, the humanitarian issue um, may be one of the most difficult issues because it is about civilians, it is about people who can't defend themselves and they totally and 100% rely on uh, the state. And here is the main trap with Russians because all the negotiations on humanitarian corridors, on uh, supplying basic needs, on providing uh, medical, uh, medical services, uh, basic medical services, on, or for example, medical treatment to those who really need, who in very difficult situations or with a heavy disease like cancer or, and so on. So uh, this is the main issues which been put in on, on, the, on, on all the negotiations during the last uh, week with Russians and the, main problem with this negotiation that sometimes they're given uh, hope or they're given promises uh, and then we had several situations even today when uh, like uh, we 
as a government prepared everything, people being ready to be evacuated, for example, or we had humanitarian uh, corridor, which been like uh, already uh, requested and they approved this corridor uh, and we couldn't proceed. In, in one case, we couldn't proceed because they started shelling. For example, it was the case uh, with the uh, Kherson region when the evacuation had to be started like uh, and the, in 10 minutes before start, uh, they said our civilians, this alarm of airplane attack. So, uh, and we couldn't proceed. They had to uh, hide in the uh, bomb shelters. What I'm trying to say that, um, yes, humanitarian situation is very hard, but even basic, uh, very urgent and obvious uh, international uh, rules, procedures, and norms, I mean, uh, international law uh, norms, which had to have to be supplied, uh, which have to be uh, followed even by aggressor. It's not followed, they don't respect, and there is no answer how to push them through this uh, uh, international requirement. The second problem, of course, uh, that Ukraine is a huge country with millions of people. It's not like small country where you have, for example, I don't know, one million refugees and you know, uh, somehow uh, you can deal uh, with the help of your neighbors, you can deal with this uh, challenge. No, Ukraine is a huge country with 40 million people. For example, uh, uh, let's imagine one million, they are mobilized now somehow. Some of them, they're soldiers, some of them are volunteers, but, uh, other people, they are civilians, and many of them has to be have to be evacuated from very dangerous zones, especially in in the south of Ukraine, in the center of Ukraine, and of course on the east of Ukraine. And the problem is that, of course, country uh, wasn't prepared, you know, to relocate millions of people from one side of Ukraine to another side of Ukraine. So we have an uh, internal challenge how to relocate these people and how to establish uh, normal conditions of life for them. Next challenge, of course, it is refugees. These people, they are fleeing from Ukraine to other countries, uh, especially it is uh, our nearest, the nearest neighbor, Poland, but also Slovakia, Germany, and some uh, other countries which are very friendly, and they uh, accept Ukrainians uh, with many uh, additional guarantees and conditions, and we really appreciate them. But even them, they can't cope with millions of Ukrainians, and they can't really quickly establish sustainable institutional uh, mechanisms, you know, to accept these uh, refugees. And um, I've been to uh, Warsaw last days, uh, uh, and uh, I've been presented our position on the special commission on humanitarian issues about Ukraine. And we've been discussing this. And my main message was, of course, it's very important to solve this problem now, to help refugees, to help internally, internally displaced people. But we need to find solution how to stop war, because the country is so big and it is impossible to relocate, to reintegrate millions of Ukrainians. We need to think about short terms. Um, short terms instruments, maybe mid terms in instruments and mechanisms, but we need to find the way how to stop this war as soon as possible. And the last but not the least, of course, uh, challenge. Uh, that's how Russian army behave with civilians. So mainly uh, civilians, they're the main uh, threat and then the main, uh, not threat, they are the main target of uh, uh, Russian army. They're using them as a, a life shield to move forward. They're using them as a, a just target to destroy. They use civilian uh, objects to hide their weapons. Uh, 
um, because they know that the Ukrainian soldiers not going to bomb, for example, uh, residency houses, and they are using this uh, in order to uh, use our people in their uh, military operations. As I told you, they are shelling and they're attacking our uh, humanitarian um, columns uh, when they are trying to move uh, with volunteers. We had this uh, situations, for example, in Kievsky region, when uh, people been trying to move to evacuate, I mean, volunteers been trying to evacuate civilians, and they've been attacked by Russian military, just directly attacked, even though they promised that they are not going to do this. And of course, they are targeting civilian, uh, uh, humanitarian, sorry, humanitarian objects, Let's, like yesterday happened in Mariupol, when they attacked uh, uh, this uh, hospital for children, and uh, uh, we had like three so three people died, among them it was one child. And uh, today it was a report of an uh, um, uh, ombudsman, and she told that uh, now it is uh, like uh, more than 70 uh, children being uh, killed during this uh, 10, 12 days of war. So uh, what I'm trying to say, so mainly they, they are using civilians um, as a main target. They just committing genocide and i think this is part of policy of politics of war uh, of russia against ukraine they are trying to threaten our people they're trying to break them and they're trying to like spread this fear among just ordinary citizens that if they are going to oppose if they are not going to accept russians here then they will will die so, uh, and uh, I believe that this is the main um, challenge which world because war is a war. We have uh, rules of war. It's established in international law, and uh, Russians decided to attack Ukraine. Okay, let them fight Ra uh, Ukrainian army. But why civilians should be um, the main target? It's like unprecedented. It's unacceptable. And I believe what should be done, it is my last uh, uh, remarks. First of all, I think that all international organizations, such as UN, I know that there are a lot of problems with mechanism to be applied because of Security Council and veto of Russian Federation. But still, we have assembly and they can um, vote through uh, for example, uh, this peaceful resolution, uh, which uh, used to be voted in the similar cases before. Also, I'm talking about Red Cross, which should be uh, actively involved in the in this in this situation, and they could give guarantees and they could negotiate with Russians to establish this uh, humanitarian to supply to those who need uh, humanitarian aid. Also, I'm talking about uh, international uh, support of the countries to establish something like humanitarian hub where uh, countries can just uh, agree between themselves how they're going to help Ukraine because many countries they're helping, but sometimes uh, because of their lack of time, lack of coordination, for example, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, products, but we have in deficit medical uh, things and other stuff. So I think that it should be some kind of coordination on international level, something like coordination center, or I don't know, coalition, humanitarian coalition, where we can agree between each other what Ukraine needs and different countries would uh, apply these needs. And also it is very important to inform, to communicate with international uh, society, what is happening in, in Ukraine, what is happening on the ground. Because we are living in 21st century. It is the center of Europe. Uh, like one week ago, a little bit more, two weeks ago, when I've been talking with my American colleagues and they've been telling me, Olena, oh, you will have a uh, bomb shelling in Kyiv. 
I was telling them, no, it is impossible. It is capital. Like it is impossible to bomb European capital. And they told me, no, you will see this because he doesn't have limits. So uh, I think that it is very important to talk about this, to talk uh, not just in the universities, but in societies uh, to discuss this. And never again, now it is very important message which should be applied all over the world and we should think together how to prevent uh, further catastrophe and i'm sure that ukraine now under the risk of humanitarian catastrophe thank you so much elena for sharing your perspective um, i wanted to remind everybody uh, in attendance at this webinar that you're welcome to um, start adding questions to the Q&A, uh, which we will get to as many as possible after um, all of our speakers. So please do add your questions. Also one other reminder that our participants have gathered a list of organizations that they recommend if you're interested in donating to help uh, in any way, you can find that in the chat. So our third and final speaker today is Olga Ivanova. Olga, please. Hello, everyone. It is an uh, honor for me to be with you today. Um, you know, I um, would like to share my unique experience of uh, becoming firstly displaced and then a refugee within just very short time. Uh, I have been dealing with um, consequences of the war in Ukraine uh, since 2015 and then founded the organization and continue this work. And I know a lot about um, plights of people who became displaced in 2014 and 2015. And of course, it was very hard to imagine that uh, I also will share their fate. Uh, just for the audience, I would like to remind that uh, we can say that the war against Ukraine started on 21st of uh, February 2022, because it started uh, in March of 2014 uh, from occupation of uh, Crimea Peninsula and uh, then uh, spread to the eastern regions, to Lugansk and Donetsk region. And what we uh, see right now, it is... Uh, probably some consequences of Russia um, not being stopped at the right time, you know, because I wonder what could happen if you see uh, all this, uh, uh, all, all this unity and all this solidarity and all this support in 2014 when uh, unfortunately a lot of international actors were reluctant uh, either supply um, Ukrainian army or uh, to put too much pressure on Russia. And right now we see the consequences of what has happened uh, that Putin uh, decided to go further. Uh, I met this uh, stage of war in my apartment in Kiev, uh, waking up as many of my uh, co-citizens from loud blasts at 5 a.m. in the morning. And unfortunately, Mm, that's uh, the very blood there this blast you can't uh, um, you can't uh, mistake for anything else and that's how the war sounds and that uh, was very scary uh because uh, you know i has been uh planning scenarios for possible development of situation at the east for my organization for different projects and yes of course uh we had this uh, in our plans uh uh, this opportunity of Russia attacking uh, Ukraine from several fronts and directions, but it was called the doomsday scenario, you know, and no one even wanted to discuss it. As Elena mentioned, it was uh, extremely important to uh, believe that it's going to happen. And uh, of course, um, I also would like to notice that it is not possible to be ready for the war. Even if you know that it may come, that there are high chances, uh, it is still not possible, neither for the country nor for individuals, uh, because it's just too much shock. And, um, you know, I spent uh, four days mostly in the basement of my house, which was, uh, and I hope it is still there, at the left bank of uh, Ukrainian capital. And uh, uh, this basement, uh, I was uh, uh, where I was. They were not neither safe nor comfortable. Uh, unfortunately, um, in Kiev, we don't have too many um, 
uh, trusted uh, bomb shellings. Mostly people just hide in the basements, which could uh, become a mass grave in uh, case if uh, the missile or any um, shell will hit the building. And uh, still it is considered safe because um, at least there are no windows and uh, uh, you hear all this blasts a little bit, not that loud as you hear in the apartment. And uh, still it is not enough of such even basements for people. And mostly uh, in all the cities where we have um, uh, these shellings right now, people still have to stay in their apartments, trying to hide somewhere like in a bus room, sleep in a bus stop, hoping that at least uh, that gonna be safer. But when you see the results of the shellings and houses destroyed uh, completely, you understand that it, it can save you, nothing can save you. And that's actually a very uh, disturbing and traumatizing feeling when you stop feeling safe at any moment and at any location and, and uh, um, you still have to continue life uh, as usual because you have to find food with empty shelves on the shop, you have to find your regular medicine, uh, which uh, also not easy with um, disturbed supplies. Uh, you have to uh, help others people and um, still that's the reality which uh, uh, happening right now for uh, probably dozens of uh, biggest uh, biggest cities in Ukraine and uh, hundreds of uh, small villages uh, which uh, remain under the fire uh, just right now. And uh, actually, um, I would like to say that, of course, um, this crisis and the, um, the humanitarian response to it should have a really very uh, strong gender um, aspect because, uh, unfortunately, the consequences are gendered. Uh, as uh, Maura mentioned, uh, men are not allowed to uh, leave Ukraine unless they are uh, and not good for the army. Unfortunately, if they have some health conditions or any uh, situations which could uh, in uh, normal life mean that they won't be sent to the army, they still not allowed to uh, leave Ukraine. So we have this disba gender disbalance from one side. We have men who leave uh, the dangerous areas because they're just trying to survive. And sometimes they even not allowed to uh, enter the uh, evacuation trains. And from other side, we have uh, divided families, a lot of women and uh, children. And sometimes children, uh, even without relatives who are sent through the border. And of course, it creates a lot of risks related to gender-based violence uh, and different abuse. And um, that's also what should be a priority uh, for humanitarian organizations abroad to watch uh, uh, and to kind of monitor what is happening with these people who sometimes go to just absolute strangers uh, to stay uh, at the location uh, for, and uh, no one knows if they are safe or not. And uh, of course, uh, I also can uh, uh, mention one uh, also important aspect of the crisis happening. You know, when I was in our um, left bank uh, basement, I felt a little bit in like a Bible story because there were so many different animals just uh, sleeping too close to each other, next to each other in the carriers cats, dogs, uh, some rodents. I myself have a um, gerbil, it's a small rodent, and I also was carrying it to the basement, and now I'm traveling with this gerbil. And uh, I see how animals also affected by this, because Ukrainians, they usually have uh, quite a lot of uh, domestic pets, and uh, for them it's also dramatic decision either to leave them behind or to take with them. And um, I hope that some charities uh, which protect pets will pay attention to these needs as well. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, leaving Kyiv was also not that easy uh, because of many, many risks. And uh, when I arrived to the railway station, uh, there was also shelling. 
and um, there was no uh, electricity at the railway uh, station because uh, because that's how we try to uh, protect ourselves from the rockets. You should avoid uh, having any lights which could guide the missiles or uh, the pilots of the uh, the war jets. And the uh, number of people who is willing to leave, uh, of course, enormous. Uh, and uh, there are fights uh, to get to the train. And uh, it is also a place to see such heartbreaking scenes as Mauro uh, saw at the border. But just when uh, men are not allowed to board the train and they say ha have to say goodbye to their uh, uh, wives, uh, sisters, uh, and other relatives, and of course it is very hard. And uh, a lot of people who were on my train, they had no understanding where they going. So they they were just googling with some mobile internet the locations at the west of Ukraine, and were trying to understand where they can go after this. So uh, no one was waiting for them there, and they were just relying on the mercy of. Uh, some people abroad. But I also would like to highlight that um, uh, we, uh, even with all this humanitarian uh, crisis, which is crisis and it's just one step from a catastrophe, um, we keep fighting and we, uh, we hope that um, we will be able to go get back home. And uh, I guess uh, just uh, some percentage of people who live in Ukraine right now and probably scary uh, Euro Europeans with this uh, number of like two million people uh, they uh, just like small percentage is hoping to stay there because uh, we left everything behind and it's our home and we want to go back as soon as the war will be uh, over and um, for us it is the only way to have it over is to win this war because uh, unfortunately Putin's statements don't uh, leave any chances that he will uh, agree on having independent strong Ukraine uh, nearby and just the the formula of anti-Russia how he calls Ukraine of course um, uh, it's just very good example of how he th thinks about our country. And uh, uh, what else uh, about humanitarian needs? Uh, right now, there are a lot of volunteers, there are a lot of organizations, uh, sometimes in co coordination with local government and national government, sometimes just independently. They try to satisfy the needs of the civilians. Part of Ukrainians, they support uh, Ukrainian army and uh, local territorial defense forces. Uh, that's also their choice uh, because people feel that they protecting them. Uh, and unfortunately, all the uh, Russian, um, how to say, approaches, uh, all uh, Russian denial to humanitarian support uh, um, of Ukrainians affected by, affected by the war, uh, Russia presents as uh, something to blame Ukraine for. So unfortunately, we see a lot of uh, fake news circulated where they blame uh, Ukrainian forces for not allowing people to leave uh, uh, via humanitarian corridors, for instance. But the problem is that uh, the only corridors which Russia recognizes, that's the corridors which lead to Russia. And from one side, uh, they put people on the situation that for them it's choice of life or death. Uh, and I, I understand people who sometimes make the choices to go to Russia to somehow survive or uh, to save their children. But uh, of course, it is not how it, it, it's supposed to do. And a lot of Ukrainians, they uh, refuse any support from Russian authorities. And uh, right now, I believe that I'm privileged, I, I, I'm, I'm safe, and all my thoughts and prayers with people who remain in Kharkiv, Mariupol, Kherson, who still uh, have no supplies of food, water, and uh, basic medicine, and of course with the Ukrainian army who is fighting right now. And I do believe that the uh, international community and uh, humanitarian actors and the Ukrainians uh, as well, who is also working hard on uh, addressing the needs, they have to do everything possible to stop this, um, this uh, uh, war, to stop this humanitarian crisis and uh, to 
uh, do everything possible not to have children dying from de dehydration in Mariupol, which is uh, encircled and uh, no one is allowed to leave it uh, safely. Um, thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Olga, uh, for sharing your perspective and your comments. Um, uh, a lot of truly devastating consequences uh, are coming out, certainly, that I think we're all um, sort of processing as you're sharing them. I will say, um, personally, I, I'm invested in your in your gerbil, with, and I hope that your ger you and your gerbil are safe in Krakow, uh, and that the gerbil could have been a guest of ours as well. But anyway, here we are. Uh, let me jump right into questions from our audience because we, we've received several excellent ones already. And again, I do encourage anybody else with a question to put them in the q and I'm going to begin with a question from Jovita Thomas, a Yale World Fellow from 2020, who writes the following. The World Bank has approved over $730 million in a humanitarian package and another 3 billion package of aid be, is being finalized. Lots of other donors are pledging and providing aid. Um, but the question here is how will all of this aid get safely into the country and how can it be used when active fighting is still going on? Or would the aid be better used for the refugees outside of the country at the current moment? Especially given the reports that the humanitarian corridors are not being honored, can humanitarian aid be actually utilized within the country? if donors succeed in getting these funds and materials inside. Uh, so I'm not sure um, if any of you have a perspective on this question. Aliana, maybe you could speak to it. Yeah, of course, of course I can start. Um, first of all, uh, we should remember, and I, I've been trying to highlight this in my uh, previous intervention, that there are two parts of humanitarian crisis. So the first one, it is uh, what is happening on the territories which blocked or attacked by Russian army. So uh, this one is very difficult because first we are trying to evacuate people. Second, we are trying to get them at least basic needs like water today to Mariupol, which been blocked. Uh, I just received the information which been one more time blocked by Russians. So, for example, now 300,000 people, can you imagine, staying without basic needs? They are staying without even drinking water. It is like, uh, it's, it's very hard to imagine. Of course, in this case, when we are talking about practical uh, things, uh, how to utilize uh, humanitarian aid, uh, first of all, we need to use uh, instruments how to push Russians to give the opportunity to utilize. But uh, another part of this coin of, of this problem, we have uh, two thirds of Ukrainian territories where we have either people who are internally displaced so uh, it is um, uh, temporary replaced uh, people and it is millions of people which uh, really in need and there are a lot of things can be done for them through the humanitarian corridors and through the humanitarian aid. And I think it is very practical. Do you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Aliana, we can hear you. Hey, hey, hey. I think I'm stuck. Mm. We can move on um, while Aliana works on her intern. Can you hear uh, us now, I, Aliana? I, I, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Where did you lost me? Uh, did, where did you lose me? Um, uh, you were talking about the humanitarian corridors. Yeah, so uh, the second part, it's, it is uh, two sorts of Ukraine where we have internally displaced people. There are, there are millions of them and they need a lot of things because they just uh, left their houses, they left their uh, cities without anything, just with maybe backpack and that's all. So we need to provide all the basic things like, uh, you know, pillows uh, and other things, of course, clothes and uh, food and other other issues. And the third one, uh, very important part, it is uh, medical support because it is also part of human humanitarian issue. 
uh, first of all, we have people who've been injured, uh, either uh, heavily injured or somehow and all of them they need medical support and i'm afraid uh, that our hospitals on the other part of the ukraine they are not ready to the numbers which we have so it could be either um, uh, trans, uh, like uh, it could be some kind of mobile hospitals from other countries which could be relocated to, to Ukraine, for example, to Lviv, to Chernovtsi or other cities which is in safe now. Or it could be a replacement of those people who injured and who could be replaced to uh, neighbor countries. And the fourth one thing, which how uh, uh, humanitarian aid could be utilized, it's just medical supply uh, for people who are, for example, with uh, difficult disease and they've been replaced from, from the dangerous uh, zones. So at least four very practical you know, directions uh, where the uh, international community could be very useful and very effective. Thank you, Alena. And maybe Mauro, a quick follow-up um, related to what Alena was just talking about since you've just come from the border. Are you seeing, this also relates to an, another question from our audience, are you seeing convoys with medical supplies entering Ukraine from neighboring countries? Um, what is the state of transportation, both of supplies and of refugees themselves back and forth across the border? Well, uh, of course, it is uh, not very easy, but I've been seeing a lot of convoys actually coming in in Poland, uh, through Poland, through Slovakia, through Hungary. And uh, so this is happening. Uh, of course, it is not happening quite quickly. And uh, uh, it's uh, it, right now there is not a, a specific uh, line for the humanitarian aid. Uh, and this should be implemented, of course. Uh, but I totally I totally agree with what Elena was saying. Actually, it is, uh, it is uh, crucial to have the humanitarian aid arriving into Ukraine because uh, my perspective Personal opinion is that uh, the, the refugees that, that make uh, outside the country somehow, let's say, are safe, but the ones that stay in Ukraine actually are the ones that are and will be uh, more in need. Uh, what we have absolutely uh, need to uh, push a bit more is uh, coordination. Uh, up to now, what I've been experiencing on the field is that uh, there is no coordination at all of the humanitarian uh, response. Uh, this is uh, working somehow very well, thanks to the solidarity of people uh, in Poland, in Hungary, in Czech Republic, in Moldova, in Romania. But uh, the government response on the humanitarian side is still a bit slow. Where the, of course, the United Nations on the ground, but uh, we we need to uh, to focus a bit more on this aspect because this will become very, very complicated. For example, we can uh, easily uh, see uh, how uh, the, the lack of organization, because right now, for example, there is not a problem of food for the refugees that uh, are uh, that leave Ukraine. But actually food is, is what people uh, tend to bring to, uh, to, to, to all the different points that we have in Hungary, in, in the volunteers point. But what we need is what, what uh, will be needed is actually medicines, is other kind of, of products. And why is this not working very well? Because there is not a coordination. Because the humanitarian response right now is mostly on the shoulders of people, of private person. This is, this is not working. And of course, we, we, this must change. And the government also, the government did something, something good with the visa free, uh, all the government except uh, UK, why, I, as we know very well. But it, this, it, it looks like this is also changing. As you know, right now, uh, for the Ukrainian that are living in the country, they don't need a visa to stay in the European Union. And mostly all the country are giving free transportation uh, on, on, on trains. Uh, all, so the only country that didn't do this yet is United Kingdom, uh, but it's, this is changing. Uh, apparently, let's let's hope so. And but again, this is another another thing that we should uh, 
that we should follow. Uh, so to, to answer, to, to give it, to, to, to close uh, the question, there are actually trains and buses that are coming back and forth Ukraine, uh, but this can be absolutely implemented and need necessarily more coordination because right now it's just people donating food and, and medicines and uh, independently arriving to Ukraine, but we need a more, a more coordinated approach. Thank you, Moro. And you you answered one of our other questions um, there with your comments, so I'm grateful for that. And it does seem as if we're hearing a lot of stories. Me personally, I've heard a lot of stories of friends, family members driving to the border, bringing supplies, but that this is very much still happening on an individual basis and that what we're looking for is a kind of international coordination of these efforts. Um, so they can be most effective. Thank you. Um, I have an additional question here uh, that, that in some sense any one of you can answer, but perhaps I'll pose it towards you, Olga, uh, which is, you know, there's been a lot of conversation here about the particular sort of demographic makeup of refugees at the moment. Uh, the fact that the majority of them are women and children, um, that families are being split at the border, even these very challenging sort of decisions about going back to Ukraine or staying in Ukraine uh, to be with other family members, these are um, um, almost sort of unimaginable decisions to be making. And so I'm wondering, um, Olga or anybody else, sort of what your sense is of, of sort of the potential or probably inevitable mental health crisis that is going to accompany this, this refugee um, situation. And if there are efforts um, that you're aware of to sort of attend to the kind of psychological and mental and emotional challenges of this moment. Uh, thank you, Molly. You actually uh, touched very uh, important topic. Uh, you know, um, I, I feel like uh, in Ukraine, we live in a uh, never ending um, uh, mental health crisis because uh, we just uh, survived the events of 2014 and all uh, upcoming years of the war at the East. And then we had COVID uh, uh, crisis, which actually also affected a lot of uh, people and so many still experiencing the uh, problems with health related to long COVID, and uh, we all know that it is also very damaging to um, mental health. And now, of course, I, I guess uh, right now we don't uh, see even the scope of the need and psychological support. Uh, from what I know, of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, volunteering initiatives, just psychologists who provide consultations free of charge. I guess that's what is prevailing. Um, regarding the coordination here, of course, uh, the cluster, the UN cluster system is working actively, but uh, I, I, being honest, I haven't seen any uh, specialized programs to those who need support. But I also think that maybe uh, for some people, um, the, uh, the support will be needed a little bit later when they will be uh, able to reflect on what happened to them because uh, right now you, like me and my uh, surroundings still we have a lot of adrenaline which is keeping us going you know but also i'd like to uh, mention that um, still it is not uh, possible to say about uh, like 100% of uh, PTSD for all people who uh, face this war. Uh, people's uh, mental system, I already talked to psychologists about the needs related to this. It is also quite resilient. So we still will be speaking about uh, a lot of people who will recover from this shock uh, quickly and just with their own resources as soon as they safe and their surrounding uh, people are safe and uh, of course we have uh, some percentage which may vary when people will be deeply traumatized and uh, i would uh, here highlight the need of children because uh, very often they are not able to express what they are feeling what is happening to them and just um, the psychologist later could uh, work with them and uh, help them because that's what we've seen, for instance, uh, when we worked with uh, uh, families displaced to Mariupol in 2015, when Mariupol was uh, seemed seem to be a place to go from uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, 
And uh, sometimes even the parents were not able to understand why the child uh, is fighting at school or started having problems with education. And when psychologists start working, it means they may uh, discover that the child was a witness for killing of some family members or some other scenes which traumatized him or her. So um, that's uh, definitely what I have to say. Maybe colleagues also would like to comment on this needs. Yeah, well, I, I think I think that you that, that uh, Olga said something very important about the future. Uh, we should uh, really understand that there are uh, absolutely two, two levels of this humanitarian crisis. One is the present, and we are trying to cope with that. And one is the future, and we will really we really need to start focusing very much on the future because uh, it is clear that we can't continue relying on people that host, host the Ukrainian at home on, uh, like you mentioned, people that go by car the border and bring them uh, to their place. Of course, this is not an approach that, that can work, but for a very easy reason. Right now, we are all very interested in this subject because we are, uh, we are, we are on the wave of the emotions, but like, uh, like for everything, this will, this will stop. It will take two, three weeks and this will stop, but the war will not stop. So the humanitarian crisis will go on also when we will not feel anymore this uh, emotional need to help the Ukrainians. And that's why we need to, to start talking a bit about, about that moment. And uh, there, are, there are two uh, things that I will quickly uh, address because I think that are important. One is uh, that we've, we've been talking a lot of, uh, about the, the children, but another side of the humanitarian uh, crisis, it, it's uh, also related to the, to the very old people. Uh, of course, the children are important, but there's a lot of old people that actually is also extremely affected by what's happening because there's also less possibility of movement. And we should not forget that this is another huge and important uh, side of the humanitarian crisis. And then uh, last thing, I think it's important to, 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 to comment or to highlight uh, because it's another part of the humanitarian crisis is uh, uh, the racism that unfortunately we've been with, I've been with, witnessing a bit in this crisis. There have been a, a lot of, of situation and I've been also experiencing something like that where uh, African, uh, Asian and Arabs in uh, being in Ukraine have been, uh, have been uh, uh, didn't uh, not the same access, uh, the same possibility to leave the country than Ukrainians. Actually, if you go right now to the website, to the official website of the Ukrainian railways, it is uh, more suggested to the foreigners to not take the train because the train is for the Ukrainians to leave. Uh, I, this is not, uh, in a, it, it is a tenim, mm, uh, there is not a judgment in what I am saying, it's just, uh, I know that it's a very difficult uh, situation and especially the people that is in charge, soldier, army, police, it's an extreme, an extreme pressure, but it's something that we uh, should also reflect a bit about. It says a lot uh, uh, about uh, about the, the European culture, not just inside Ukraine, also in the countries that are receiving. Uh, I've been seeing also that it is much easier for the people that are receiving to offer a bed where to sleep to an Ukrainian than to an African. And uh, again, I, I believe that since we are talking of uh, humanity and humanitarian side, this is a point that uh, had to be addressed. Thank you so much for bringing up these important points, Moro. Um, we are out of time, but Aliana, I would love to give you an opportunity to make one final comment if you have one. Yeah, of course. Uh, my final comment would be uh, about Ukrainians and what they are doing inside the country in order to help each other. I just received, for example, you've been asking about evacuation and how to provide this. Uh, for example, we have very famous uh, uh, transport service, Uklon, it is the same like Uber. Today they uh, provided new kind of service, it is evacuation. So you can find the free driver and he will bring you from one point to another in order to help you to be evacuated. So it is just a small example, but this example is about how Ukrainians trying to mobilize all their resources in order to help each other. I never saw such mobilization before. Thank you so much, Elena. And I wanted to once again thank all of our, our, our guests today, Moro Mandelo, Elena Sotnik, and Olga Ivanova, 
uh, your contributions have been um, incredibly uh, sort of thought provoking, unsettling, also inspiring at moments. We wish you all safety. We wish you all the very best. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that there is a link in the chat with suggested resources for um, helping out the refugee crisis. You can also always write the Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies Program at Yale and we can provide you that information as well. Once again, thanks to the three of you. Thank you to all of our attendees. <laughs> Goodbye.